Greetings, listeners. We're back once again to talk to you about the Cthulhu Mythos, its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits like the dreamlands, or things of a weird nature, or things that are lovecrafty and leaning, weird fiction, science fiction, horror, learn of terrible meetings in lonely places, of cyclopean ruins, and vast staircases that lead down to abysses of knighted secrets, of complex angles that lead through invisible walls to other regions of space and time, and of hideous explorations in remote and forbidden places on other worlds and in different time-space continua. From the creation of our galaxy to the death of the sun, this is an exploration of the Cthulhu mythos from the perspective of humans' concept of history. We are the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. You can find us at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos starts now. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Season 8. Hey everyone, this is D.B. Spitzer here. It's one of those fabulous, fabulous reading episodes, and I just wanted to introduce it. This is October, and October here is going to be, this year, a month of Lord Dunsany. So, enjoy the Gods of Pagania. Part 1 of The Gods of Pagana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Mills. The Gods of Pagana by Lord Edward J.M.D. Plunkett Dunsany. Part 1. Preface. In the mists before the beginning, fate and chance cast lots to decide whose the game should be, and he that won strode through the mists to Mana Yud Sushai, and said, Now make gods for me, for I have won the cast, and the game is to be mine. Who it was that won the cast, and whether it was fate or whether chance that went through the mists before the beginning to Mana Yud Sushai, none knoweth. Introduction Before there stood gods upon Olympus, or ever Allah was Allah, had wrought and rested Mana Yud Sushai. There are in Pagana Mung and Sish and Kib, and the maker of all small gods who is Mana Yud Sushai. Moreover, we have a faith in Rune and Slid. And it has been said of old that all things that have been were wrought by the small gods, excepting only Mana Yud Sushai, who made the gods and hath thereafter rested. And none may pray to Mana Yud Sushai, but only the gods whom he hath made. But at the last will Mana Yud Sushai forget to rest, and will make again new gods and other worlds, and will destroy the gods whom he hath made. And the gods and the worlds shall depart, and there shall be only Mana Yud Sushai. Of Skarl the Drummer when Mana Yud Sushai had made the gods and Skarl, Skarl made a drum, and began to beat upon it that he might drum for ever. Then, because he was weary after the making of the gods, and because of the drumming of Skarl, did Mana Yud Sushai grow drowsy and fall asleep. And there fell a hush upon the gods when they saw that Mana rested, and there was silence on Pagana, save for the drumming of Skarl. Skarl sitteth upon the mist before the feet of Mana Yud Sushai, above the gods of Pagana, and there he beateth his drum. Some say that the worlds and the suns are but the echoes of the drumming of Skarl, and others say that they be dreams that arise in the mind of Mana because of the drumming of Skarl, as one may dream whose rest is troubled by sound of song. But none knoweth, for who hath heard the voice of Mana Yud Sushai, or who hath seen his drummer? Whether the season be winter, or whether it be summer, whether it be morning among the worlds, or whether it be night, Skarl still beateth his drum, 
for the purposes of the gods are not yet fulfilled. Sometimes the arm of Skarl grows weary, but still he beateth his drum, that the gods may do the work of the gods, and the worlds go on. For if he cease for an instant, then Mana Yutsushai will start awake, and there will be worlds, nor gods, no more. But when at the last the arm of Skarl shall cease to beat his drum, silence shall startle Pagana like thunder in a cave, and Mana Yutsushai shall cease to rest. Then shall Skarl put his drum upon his back, and walk forth into the void beyond the worlds, because it is the end, and the work of Skarl is over. There may arise some other god whom Skarl may serve, or it may be that he shall perish. But to Skarl it shall matter not, for he shall have done the work of Skarl. Of the Making of the Worlds When Mana Yutsushai had made the gods, there were only the gods, and they sat in the middle of time, for there was as much time before them as behind them, which having no end, had neither a beginning. And Pagana was without heat, or light, or sound, save for the drumming of Skarl. Moreover, Pagana was the middle of all, for there was below Pagana what there was above it, and there lay before it that which lay beyond. Then said the gods, making the signs of the gods, and speaking with their hands, lest the silence of Pagana should blush. Then said the gods to one another, speaking with their hands, Let us make worlds to amuse ourselves while Mana rests. Let us make worlds and life and death, and colours in the sky. Only let us not break the silence upon Pagana. Then, raising their hands, each god according to his sign, they made the worlds and the suns, and put a light in the houses of the sky. Then said the gods, Let us make one to seek, to seek and never to find out concerning the wherefore of the making of the gods. And they made by the lifting of their hands, each god according to his sign, the bright one with the flaring tail, to seek from the end of the worlds to the end of them again, to return again after a hundred years. Man, when thou seest the comet, know that another seeketh besides thee, nor ever findeth out. Then said the gods, still speaking with their hands, Let there be now a watcher to regard. And they made the moon, with his face wrinkled with many mountains, and worn with a thousand valleys, to regard with pale eyes the games of the small gods, and to watch throughout the resting time of Mana Yutsushai. To watch, to regard all things, and be silent. Then said the gods, Let us make one to rest, one not to move among the moving, one not to seek like the comet, nor to go round like the worlds, to rest while Mana rests. And they made the star of the abiding, and set it in the north, Man, when thou seest the star of the abiding to the north, know that one resteth, as doth Mana Yudsushai, and know that somewhere among the worlds is rest. Lastly the gods said, We have made worlds and suns, and one to seek, and another to regard. Let us now make one to wonder. And they made earth to wonder, each god by the uplifting of his hand according to his sign, and earth was. Of the Game of the Gods A million years passed over the first game of the gods, and Mana Yutsushai still rested, still in the middle of time, and the gods still played with worlds. The moon regarded, the bright one sought, and returned again to his seeking. Then Kib grew weary of the first game of the gods, and raised his hand in Pagana making the sign of Kib, and earth became covered with beasts for Kib to play with, and Kib played with beasts. But the other gods said one to another, speaking with their hands, What is it that Kib has done? And they said to Kib, What are these things that move upon the earth, yet move not in circles like the worlds, that regard like the moon, and yet they do not shine? And Kib said, This is life. But the gods said one to another, if Kib has thus made beasts, he will in time make men, and will endanger the secret of the gods. And Mung was jealous of the work of Kib, and sent down death among the beasts, but could not stamp them out. A million years passed over the second game of the gods, and still it was the middle of time. 
and Kib grew weary of the second game, and raised his hand in the middle of all, making the sign of Kib, and made men. Out of beasts he made them, and earth was covered with men. Then the gods feared greatly for the secret of the gods, and set a veil between man and his ignorance that he might not understand, and Mung was busy among men. But when the other gods saw Kib playing his new game, they came and played it too. And this they will play until Mana arises to rebuke them, saying, What do ye, playing with worlds, and sons, and men, and life, and death? And they shall be ashamed of their playing in the hour of the laughter of Mana Yud Sushai. It was Kib who first broke the silence of Pagana by speaking with his mouth like a man. And all the other gods were angry with Kib that he had spoken with his mouth. And there was no longer silence in Pagana or the worlds. The Chaunt of the Gods There came the voice of the gods singing the chaunt of the gods, singing, We are the gods, we are the little games of Mana Yud Sushai that he hath played and hath forgotten. Mana Yud Sushai hath made us, and we made the worlds and the suns, and we play with the worlds and the sun and life and death until Mana arises to rebuke us, saying, What do ye playing with worlds and suns? It is a very serious thing that there be worlds and suns, and yet most withering is the laughter of Mana Yud Sushai. And when he arises from resting at the last, and laughs at us for playing with worlds and suns, we will hastily put them behind us, and there shall be worlds no more. The Sayings of Kib, Sender of Life in All the Worlds Kib said, I am Kib. I am none other than Kib. Kib is Kib. Kib is he and no other. Believe. Kib said, When time was early, when time was very early indeed, there was only Mana Yud Sushai. Mana Yud Sushai was before the beginning of the gods, and shall be after their going. And Kib said, After the going of the gods, there will be no small worlds nor big. Kib said, It will be lonely for Mana Yud Sushai. Because this is written, believe. For is it not written? Or are you greater than Kib? Kib is Kib. Concerning Sish, the destroyer of ours, Time is the hound of Sish. At Sish's bidding do the hours run before him, as he goeth upon his way. Never hath Sish stepped backward, nor ever hath he tarried. Never hath he relented to the things that once he knew, nor turned to them again. Before Sish is Kib, and behind him goeth Mung. Very pleasant are all things before the face of Sish, but behind him they are withered and old. And Sish goeth ceaselessly upon his way. Once the gods walked upon earth as men walk, and spake with their mouths like men. That was in Warnoth Mavai. They walk not now. And Warnoth Mavai was a garden fairer than all the gardens upon earth. Kib was propitious, and Mung raised not his hand against it, neither did Sish assail it with his hours. Warnoth Mavai lieth in a valley, and looketh towards the south, and on the slopes of it Sish rested among the flowers when Sish was young. Thence Sish went forth into the world to destroy its cities, and to provoke his hours to assail all things, and to batter against them with the rust and with the dust. And time, which is the hound of Sish, devoured all things. And Sish sent up the ivy and fostered weeds, and dust fell from the hand of Sish and covered stately things. Only the valley where Sish rested when he and time were young did Sish not provoke his hours to assail. There he restrained his old hound, Time, and at its borders Mung withheld his footsteps. Warneth Mavai still lieth looking towards the south, a garden among gardens, and still the flowers grow about its slopes as they grew when the gods were young, and even the butterflies live in Warneth Mavai still, for the minds of the gods relent towards their earliest memories, who relent not otherwise at all. Warneth Mavai still lieth looking towards the south, but if thou shouldst ever find it, thou art then more fortunate than the gods, because they walk not in Warnoth Mavai now. Once did the prophet think that he discerned it in the distance beyond mountains, 
a garden exceeding fair with flowers. But Sish arose, and pointed with his hand, and set his hound to pursue him, who hath followed ever since. Time is the hound of the gods, but it hath been said of old that he will one day turn upon his masters, and seek to slay the gods, excepting only Mana Yudsushai, whose dreams are the gods themselves, dreamed long ago. Part 2 The sayings of Slid, whose soul is by the sea. Slid said, Let no man pray to Mana Yudsushai, for who shall trouble Mana with mortal woes, or irk him with the sorrows of all the houses of earth? Nor let any sacrifice to Mana Yudsushai, for what glory shall he find in sacrifices or altars who hath made the gods themselves? Pray to the small gods, who are the gods of doing. But Mana is the god of having done, the god of having done, and of the resting. Pray to the small gods, and hope that they may hear thee. Yet what mercy should the small gods have, who themselves made death and pain? Or shall they restrain their old hound time for thee? Slid is but a small god, yet Slid is Slid. It is written and hath been said. Pray thou therefore to Slid, and forget not Slid, and it may be that Slid will not forget to send thee death when most thou needest it. And the people of earth said, There is a melody upon the earth, as though ten thousand streams all sang together for their homes that they had forsaken in the hills. And Slid said, I am the lord of gliding waters, and of foaming waters, and of still. I am the lord of all the waters in the world, and all that long streams garner in the hills. But the soul of Slid is in the sea. Thither goes all that glides upon earth, and the end of all the rivers is the sea. And Slid said, The hand of Slid hath toyed with cataracts, and down the valleys have trod the feet of Slid, and out of the lakes of the plains regard the eyes of Slid. But the soul of Slid is in the sea. Much homage hath Slid among the cities of men, and pleasant are the woodland paths, and the paths of the plains, and pleasant the high valleys where he danceth in the hills. But Slid would be fettered neither by banks nor boundaries, so the soul of Slid is in the sea. For there may Slid repose beneath the sun, and smile at the gods above him with all the smiles of Slid, and be a happier god than those who sway the worlds, whose work is life and death. There may he sit and smile, or creep among the ships, or moan and sigh round islands in his great content, the miser lord of wealth in gems and pearls beyond the telling of old fables. Or there may he, when Slid would fain exult, throw up his great arms, or toss with many a fathom of wandering hair the mighty head of Slid, or cry aloud tumultuous dirges of shipwreck, and feel through all his being the crashing might of Slid, and sway the sea. Then doth the sea, like venturous legions on the eve of war that exult to acclaim their chief, gather its force together from under all the winds, and roar and follow and sing and crash together to vanquish all things, and all at the bidding of Slid, whose soul is in the sea. There is ease in the soul of Slid, and there be calms upon the sea. Also there be storms upon the sea, and troubles in the soul of Slid, for the gods have many moods, and Slid is in many places, for he sitteth in high Pagana. Also along the valleys walketh Slid, wherever water moveth or lieth still. But the voice and the cry of Slid are from the sea. And to whoever that cry hath ever come, he must needs follow and follow, leaving all stable things, only to be always with Slid, in all the moods of Slid, to find no rest until he reaches the sea. With the cry of Slid before them, and the hills of their home behind have gone a hundred thousand to the sea, over whose bones doth Slid lament with the voice of a god lamenting for his people. Even the streams from the inner lands have heard Slid's far-off cry, and altogether have forsaken lawns and trees to follow where Slid is gathering up his own, to rejoice where Slid rejoices, singing the chaunt of Slid, even as will at the last gather all the lives of the people about the feet of Mana Yutsushai. The Deeds of Mung, Lord of all Deaths between Pagana and the Rim 
Once, as Mung went his way athwart the earth, and up and down its cities and across its plains, Mung came upon a man who was afraid when Mung said, I am Mung. And Mung said, Were the forty million years before thy coming intolerable to thee? And Mung said, Not less tolerable to thee shall be the forty million years to come. Then Mung made against him the sign of Mung, and the life of the man was fettered no longer with hands and feet. At the end of the flight of the arrow there is Mung, and in the houses and the cities of men. Mung walketh in all places at all times, but mostly he loves to walk in the dark and still, along the river mists when the wind hath sank, a little before night meeteth with the morning upon the highway between Pagana and the worlds. Sometimes Mung entereth the poor man's cottage, Mung also boweth very low before the king. Then do the lives of the poor man and of the king go forth among the worlds. And Mung said, Many turnings hath the road that Kib hath given every man to tread upon the earth. Behind one of these turnings sitteth Mung. One day, as a man trod upon the road that Kib had given him to tread, he came suddenly upon Mung. And when Mung said, I am Mung, the man cried out, Alas, that I took this road, for had I gone by any other way, then had I not met with Mung. And Mung said, Had it been possible for thee to go by any other way, then had the scheme of things been otherwise, and the gods had been other gods. When Mana Yutsushai forgets to rest, and makes again new gods, it may be that they will send thee again into the worlds, and then thou mayest choose some other way, and not meet with Mung. Then Mung made the sign of Mung and the life of that man went forth with yesterday's regrets, and all old sorrows and forgotten things, whither Mung knoweth. And Mung went onward with his work to sunder life from flesh, and Mung came upon a man who became stricken with sorrow when he saw the shadow of Mung. But Mung said, When at the sign of Mung thy life shall float away, there will also disappear thy sorrow at forsaking it. But the man cried out, O Mung, tarry for a little, and make not the sign of Mung against me now, for I have a family upon the earth with whom sorrow will remain, though mine should disappear because of the sign of Mung. And Mung said, With the gods it is always now. And before Sish hath banished many of the years, the sorrows of thy family for thee shall go the way of thine. And the man beheld Mung making the sign of Mung before his eyes, which beheld things no more. THE CHAUNT OF THE PRIESTS This is the chaunt of the priests, the chaunt of the priests of Mung. This is the chaunt of the priests. All day long to Mung cry out the priests of Mung, and yet Mung hearkeneth not. What then shall avail the prayers of all the people? Rather bring gifts to the priests, gifts to the priests of Mung. So shall they cry louder unto Mung than ever was their wont. And it may be that Mung shall hear, not any longer then shall fall the shadow of Mung athwart the hopes of the people. Not any longer then shall the tread of Mung darken the dreams of the people. Not any longer shall the lives of the people be loosened because of Mung. Bring ye gifts to the priests, gifts to the priests of Mung. This is the chaunt of the priests, the chaunt of the priests of Mung. This is the chaunt of the priests. The sayings of Limpang Tung, the god of mirth and of melodious minstrels. And Limpang Tung said, The ways of the gods are strange. The flower groweth up, and the flower fadeth away. This may be very clever of the gods. Man groweth from his infancy, and in a while he dieth. This may be very clever too. But the gods play with a strange scheme. I will send jests into the world, and a little mirth. And while death seems to thee as far away as the purple rim of hills, or sorrow as far off as rain in the blue days of summer, then pray to Limpang Tung. But when thou growest old, or ere thou diest, pray not of Limpang Tung, for thou becomest part of a scheme that he doth not understand. Go out into the starry night, and Limpang Tung will dance with thee, who danced since the gods were young, the god of mirth and of melodious minstrels. Or offer up a jest to Limpang Tung. Only pray not in thy sorrow to Limpang Tung, for he saith of sorrow, it may be very clever of the gods, but he doth not understand. And Limpang Tung said, I am lesser than the gods. Pray therefore to the small gods, and not to Limpang Tung. 
Nevertheless, between Pagana and the earth flutter ten thousand thousand prayers that beat their wings against the face of death, and never for one of them hath the hand of the striker been stayed, nor yet have tarried the feet of the relentless one. Utter thy prayer. It may accomplish where failed ten thousand thousand. Limpang Tung is lesser than the gods, and doth not understand. And Limpang Tung said, Lest men grow weary down on the great worlds through gazing always at a changeless sky, I will paint my pictures in the sky, and I will paint them twice in every day, for so long as days shall be. Once as the day ariseth out of the homes of dawn will I paint the blue, that men may see and rejoice, and ere day falleth under into the night will I paint upon the blue again, lest men be sad. It is a little, said Limpang Tung. It is a little even for a god to give some pleasure to men upon the worlds. And Limpang Tung hath sworn that the pictures that he paints shall never be the same for so long as the days shall be. And this he hath sworn by the oath of the gods of Pagana, that the gods may never break, laying his hand upon the shoulder of each of the gods, and swearing by the light behind their eyes. Limpang Tung hath lured a melody out of the stream, and stolen its anthem from the forest. For him the wind hath cried in lonely places, and the ocean sung its dirges. There is music for Limpang Tung in the sounds of the moving of grass, and in the voices of the people that lament, or in the cry of them that rejoice. In an inner mountain land, where none hath come, he hath carved his organ pipes out of the mountains, and there, when the winds, his servants, come in from all the world, he maketh the melody of Limpang Tung. But the song, arising at night, goeth forth like a river, winding through all the world, and here and there amid the peoples of earth one heareth, and straight away all that hath voice to sing crieth aloud in music to his soul. Or sometimes, walking through the dusk with steps unheard by men, in a form unseen by the people, Limpang Tung goeth abroad, and, standing behind the minstrels in cities of song, waveth his hands above them to and fro, and the minstrels bend to their work, and the voice of the music ariseth and mirth and melody abound in that city of song, and no one seeth Limpang Tung, as he standeth behind the minstrels. But through the mists towards morning, in the dark, when the minstrels sleep, and mirth and melody have sunk to rest, Limpang Tung goeth back again to his mountain land. Part 3 Of Yohoneth Lahai, the god of little dreams and fancies. Yohoneth Lahai is the god of little dreams and fancies. All night he sendeth little dreams out of Pagana to please the people of earth. He sendeth little dreams to the poor man and to the king. He is so busy to send his dreams to all before the night be ended that oft he forgetteth which be the poor man and which be the king. To whom Yohoneth Lahai cometh not with little dreams and sleep, he must endure all night the laughter of the gods with highest mockery in Pagana. All night long Yohoneth Lahai giveth peace to cities until the dawn hour and the departing of Yohoneth Lahai, when it is time for the gods to play with men again. Whether the dreams and the fancies of Yohoneth Lahai be false, and the things that are done in the day be real, or the things that are done in the day be false, and the dreams and the fancies of Yohaneth Lahai be true, none knoweth, saving only Mana Yud Sushai, who hath not spoken. Of Rune, the god of going, and the thousand home gods. Rune said, There be gods of moving, and gods of standing still, but I am the god of going. It is because of Rune that the worlds are never still, for the moons and the worlds and the comet are stirred by the spirit of Rune, which saith, Go! 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 Rune met the worlds all in the morning of things, before there was light upon Pagana, and Rune danced before them in the void, since when they are never still. Rune sendeth all streams to the sea, 
and all rivers to the soul of slid. Rune maketh the sign of Rune before the waters, and lo, they have left the hills. And Rune hath spoken in the ear of the north wind, that he may be still no more. The footfall of Rune hath been heard at evening outside the houses of men, and thenceforth comfort and abiding know them no more. Before them stretcheth travel over all the lands, long miles, and never resting between their homes and their graves, and all at the bidding of Rune. The mountains have set no limit against Rune, nor all the seas are boundary. Whither Rune hath desired, there must Rune's people go, and the worlds, and their streams, and the winds. I heard the whisper of Rune at evening, saying, There are islands of spices to the south, and the voice of Rune saying, Go. And Rune said, There are a thousand home gods, the little gods that sit before the hearth and mind of the fire. There is one Rune. Rune saith in a whisper, in a whisper when none heareth, when the sun is low, What doeth Mana Yud Sushai? Rune is no god that thou mayest worship by the hearth, nor will he be benignant to thy home. Offer to Rune thy toiling and thy speed, whose incense is the smoke of the campfire to the south, whose song is the sound of going, whose temples stand beyond the farthest hills in his lands behind the east. Yarinareth, 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 which signifieth beyond. These words be carved in letters of gold upon the arch of the great portal of the Temple of Rune that men have builded looking towards the east upon the sea, where Rune is carved as a giant trumpeter, with his trumpet pointing towards the east beyond the seas. Whoso heareth his voice, the voice of Rune at evening, he at once forsaketh the home gods that sit beside the hearth. These be the gods of the hearth. Pitsu, who stroketh the cat, Hobbith, who calms the dog, and Habaniah, the lord of glowing embers, and little Zombibu, the lord of dust, and old Griborn, who sits in the heart of the fire to turn the wood to ash. All these be home gods, and live not in Pagana, and be lesser than Rune. There is also Kilulugung, the lord of a rising smoke, who taketh the smoke from the hearth, and sendeth it to the sky who is pleased if it reacheth Pagana, so that the gods of Pagana, speaking to the gods, say, There is Kilulugung, doing the work on earth of Kilulugung. All these are gods so small that they be lesser than men, but pleasant gods to have beside the hearth. And often men have prayed to Kilulugung, saying, Thou whose smoke ascendeth to Pagana, send up with it our prayers, that the gods may hear. And Kilulugung, who is pleased that men should pray, stretches himself up all grey and lean, with his arms above his head, and sendeth his servant the smoke to seek Pagana, that the gods of Pagana may know that the people pray. And Jabim is the lord of broken things, who sitteth behind the house to lament the things that are cast away. And there he sitteth lamenting the broken things, until the worlds be ended, or until someone cometh to mend the broken things. Or sometimes he sitteth by the river's edge, to lament the forgotten things that drift upon it. A kindly god is Jabim, whose heart is sore if anything be lost. There is also Tribugi, the lord of dusk, whose children are the shadows, who sitteth in a corner far off from Habaniah, and speaketh to none. But after Habaniah hath gone to sleep, and old Gribon hath blinked a hundred times, until he forgetteth which be wood or ash, then doth Tribugi send his children to run about the room and dance upon the walls, but never disturb the silence. But when there is light again upon the worlds, and dawn comes dancing down the highway from Pagana, then does Tribugi retire into his corner, with his children all around him, as though they had never danced about the room. And the slaves of Habaniah and old Gribon come and awake them from their sleep upon the hearth, and Pitsu strokes the cat, and Hobbith calms the dog, and Kilulugung stretches aloft his arms towards Pagana, and Tribugi is very still, and his children asleep. And when it is dark, all in the hour of Tribugi, Hish creepeth from the forest, the lord of silence, whose children are the bats, that have broken the command of their father, but in a voice that is ever so low. Hish husheth the mouse, and all the whispers in the night, he maketh all noises still, only the cricket rebelleth, but Hish hath set against him such a spell 
that after he hath cried a thousand times, his voice may be heard no more, but becometh part of the silence. And when he hath slain all sounds, Hish boweth low to the ground. Then cometh into the house, with never a sound of feet, the god Yohoneth Lahai. But away in the forest, whence Hish hath come, Wahoon, the lord of noises in the night, awaketh in his lair, and creepeth round the forest to see whether it be true that Hish hath gone. Then in some glade, Wahoon lifts up his voice, and cries aloud, that all the night may hear, that it is he, Wahoon, who is abroad in all the forest. And the wolf, and the fox, and the owl, and the great beasts and the small, lift up their voices to acclaim Wahoon. And there arise the sounds of voices, and the stirring of leaves. THE REVOLT OF THE HOME GODS There be three broad rivers of the plain, born before memory or fable, whose mothers are three grey peaks, and whose father was the storm. Their names be Aimes, Zanes, and Segastrion. And Aimes is the joy of lowing herds, and Zanes hath bowed his neck to the yoke of man, and carries the timber from the forest far up below the mountain. And Segastrian sings old songs to shepherd boys, singing of his childhood in a lone ravine, and of how he once sprang down the mountain sides and far away into the plain to see the world, and of how one day at last he will find the sea. These be the rivers of the plain, wherein the plain rejoices. But old men tell, whose fathers heard it from the ancients, how once the lords of the three rivers of the plain rebelled against the law of the worlds, and passed beyond their boundaries, and joined together, and whelmed cities, and slew men, saying, We now play the game of the gods, and slay men for our pleasure, and we be greater than the gods of Pagana. And all the plain was flooded to the hills. And Aimes, Zanes, and Segastrian sat upon the mountains, and spread their hands over their rivers that rebelled by their command. But the prayer of men going upward found Pagana, and cried in the ear of the gods, there be three home gods who slay us for their pleasure, and say that they be mightier than Pagana's gods, and play their game with men. Then were all the gods of Pagana very wroth, but they could not whelm the lords of the three rivers, because, being home gods, though small, they were immortal. And still the home gods spread their hands across their rivers, with their fingers wide apart, and the waters rose and rose, and the voice of their torrent grew louder, crying, are we not Ames, Zanes, and Sagastrian? Then Mung went down into a waste of Africa, and came upon the drought Umbul, as he sat in the desert upon iron rocks, clawing with miserly grasp at the bones of men, and breathing hot. And Mung stood before him as his dry sides heaved, and ever as they sank his hot breath blasted dry sticks and bones. Then Mung said, Friend of Mung, Go thou, and grin before the faces of Aimes, Zanes, and Sagastrian, till they see whether it be wise to rebel against the gods of Pagana. And Umbul answered, I am the beast of Mung. And Umbul came and crouched upon a hill upon the other side of the waters, and grinned across them at the rebellious home gods. And whenever Aimes, Zanes, and Sagastrian stretched out their hands over their rivers, they saw before their faces the grinning of Umbul. And because the grinning was like death in a hot and hideous land, therefore they turned away, and spread their hands no more over their rivers, and the waters sank and sank. But when Umbul had grinned for thirty days, the waters fell back into the river beds, and the lords of the rivers slunk away back again to their homes. Still Umbul sat and grinned. Then Aimes sought to hide himself in a great pool beneath a rock, and Zanes crept into the middle of a wood, and Sagastrian lay and panted on the sand. Still Umbul sat and grinned. And Aimes grew lean, and was forgotten, so that the men of the plain would say, Here once was Aimes. And Zanes scarce had strength to lead his river to the sea. And as Sagastrian lay and panted, a man stepped over his stream. And Sagastrian said, it is the foot of a man that has passed across my neck, and I have sought to be greater than the gods of Pagana. Then said the gods of Pagana, It is enough. We are the gods of Pagana, 
and none are equal. Then Mung sent Umbul back to his waste in Afric to breathe again upon the rocks and parch the desert, and to sear the memory of Afric into the brains of all who ever bring their bones away. And Aimes, Zanes, and Sagastrian sang again, and walked once more in their accustomed haunts, and played the game of life and death with fishes and frogs, but never essayed to play it any more with men, as do the gods of Pagana. Part 4 Of Dorajand, whose eyes regard the end. Sitting above the lives of the people, and looking, doth Dorajand see that which is to be. The god of destiny is Dorajand. Upon whom have looked the eyes of Dorajand, he goeth forward to an end that naught may stay. He becometh the arrow from the bow of Dorajand, hurled forward at a mark he may not see, to the goal of Dorajand. Beyond the thinking of men, beyond the sight of all the other gods, regard the eyes of Dorajand. He hath chosen his slaves, and then doth the destiny god drive onward where he will, who, knowing not whither, nor even knowing why, feel only his scourge behind them, or hear his cry before. There is something that Dorajand would fain achieve, and, therefore, hath he set the people striving, with none to cease or rest in all the worlds. But the gods of Pagana, speaking to the gods, say, What is it that Dorajand would fain achieve? It hath been written, and said, that not only the destinies of men are the care of Dorajand, but that even the gods of Pagana be not unconcerned by his will. All the gods of Pagana have felt a fear, for they have seen a look in the eyes of Dorajand that regardeth beyond the gods. The reason and purpose of the worlds is that there should be life upon the worlds, and life is the instrument of Dorajand, wherewith he would achieve his end. Therefore the worlds go on, and the rivers run to the sea, and life ariseth and flieth even in all the worlds, and the gods of Pagana do the work of the gods, and all for Dorajand. But when the end of Dorajand hath been achieved, there will be need no longer of life upon the worlds, nor any more a game for the small gods to play. Then will Kib tiptoe gently across Pagana to the resting place in highest Pagana of Mana Yud Sushai, and, touching reverently his hand, the hand that wrought the gods, say, Mana Yud Sushai, thou hast rested long. And Mana Yud Sushai shall say, Not so, for I have rested but fifty eons of the gods each of them scarce more than ten million mortal years of the worlds that ye have made. And then shall the gods be afraid, when they find that Mana knoweth that they have made worlds while he rested. And they shall answer, Nay, but the worlds came all of themselves. Then Mana yud Sushai, as one who would have done with an irksome matter, will lightly wave his hand, the hand that wrought the gods, and there shall be gods no more. When there shall be three moons towards the north above the star of the abiding, three moons that neither wax nor wane but regard towards the north, or when the comet ceaseth from his seeking and stands still, not any longer moving among the worlds, but tarrying as one who rests after the end of search, then shall arise from resting, because it is the end, the greater one, who rested of old time, even Mana Yud Sushai. Then shall the times that were be times no more. And it may be that the old, dead days shall return from beyond the rim, and we who have wept for them shall see those days again, as one who, returning from long travel to his home, comes suddenly on dear remembered things. For none shall know of Mana, who hath rested for so long, whether he be a harsh or merciful god. It may be that he shall have mercy, and that these things shall be. THE EYE IN THE WASTE There lie seven deserts beyond Bodrahan, which is the city of the caravan's end. None goeth beyond. In the first desert lie the tracks of mighty travellers outward from Bodrahan, and some returning. And in the second lie only outward tracks, and none return. 
The third is a desert untrodden by the feet of men. The fourth is the desert of sand, and the fifth is the desert of dust, and the sixth is the desert of stones, and the seventh is the desert of deserts. In the midst of the last of the deserts that lie beyond Bodrahan, in the centre of the desert of deserts, standeth the image that hath been hewn of old out of the living hill, whose name is Ranarada, the eye in the waste. About the base of Ranarada is carved in mystic letters that are vaster than the beds of streams these words, To the God who knows. Now beyond the second desert are no tracks, and there is no water in all the seven deserts that lie beyond Bodrahan. Therefore came no man thither to hew that statue from the living hills, and Ranarada was wrought by the hands of gods. Men tell in Bodrahan, where the caravans end and all the drivers of the camels rest, how once the gods hewed Ranarada from the living hill, hammering all night long beyond the deserts. Moreover, they say that Ranarada is carved in the likeness of the god Hudrazai, who hath found the secret of Mana Yudsushai, and knoweth the wherefore of the making of the gods. They say that Hudrazai stands all alone in Pagana, and speaks to none, because he knows what is hidden from the gods. Therefore the gods have made his image in a lonely land, as one who thinks, and is silent. The eye in the waste. They say that Hudrazai had heard the murmurs of Mana Yudsushai, as he muttered to himself, and gleaned the meaning, and knew, and that he was the god of mirth and of abundant joy, but became from the moment of his knowing a mirthless god, even as his image, which regards the deserts beyond the track of man. But the camel drivers, as they sit and listen to the tales of the old men in the marketplace of Bodrahan, at evening, while the camels rest, say, If Hudrazai is so very wise, and yet is sad, let us drink wine and banish wisdom to the wastes that lie beyond Bodrahan. Therefore is there feasting and laughter all night long in the city where the caravans end. All this the camel drivers tell when the caravans come in from Bodrahan. But who shall credit tales that camel drivers have heard from aged men in so remote a city? Of the thing that is neither god nor beast. Seeing that wisdom is not in cities, nor happiness in wisdom, and because Yardin the prophet was doomed by the gods ere he was born to go in search of wisdom, he followed the caravans to Bodrahan. There in the evening, where the camels rest, when the wind of the day ebbs out into the desert, sighing amid the palms its last farewells, and leaving the caravans still, he sent his prayer with the wind to drift into the desert, calling to Hudrazai. And down the wind his prayer went, calling, why do the gods endure, and play their game with men? Why doth not Skarl forsake his drumming, and Mana cease to rest? And the echo of seven deserts answered, Who knows? Who knows? But out in the waste, beyond the seven deserts, where Ranarada looms enormous in the dusk, at evening his prayer was heard. And from the rim of the waste, whither had gone his prayer, came three flamingos flying, and their voices said, Going south, going south, at every stroke of their wings. But as they passed by the prophet, they seemed so cool and free, and the desert so blinding and hot, that he stretched up his arms towards them. Then it seemed happy to fly, and pleasant to follow behind great white wings, and he was with the three flamingos, up in the cool above the desert, and their voices cried before him, Going south, going south, and the desert below him mumbled, Who knows? Who knows? Sometimes the earth stretched up towards them with peaks of mountains, sometimes it fell away in steep ravines. Blue rivers sang to them as they passed above them, or very faintly came the song of breezes in lone orchards, and far away the sea sang mighty dirges of old forsaken isles. But it seemed that in all the world there was nothing, only to be going south. It seemed that somewhere the south was calling to her own, and that they were going south. But when the prophet saw that they had passed above the edge of earth, and that far away to the north of them lay the moon, he perceived that he was following no mortal birds, but some strange messengers of Hudrazai, whose nest had lain in one of Pagana's vales, below the mountains whereon sit the gods. 
still they went south, passing by all the worlds, and leaving them to the north, till only Araxes, Zadris, and Hiraglion lay still to the south of them, where great Ingazi seemed only a point of light, and Yo and Mindo could be seen no more. Still they went south, till they passed below the south, and came to the rim of the worlds. There there is neither south, nor east, nor west, but only north and beyond. There is only north of it where lie the worlds, and beyond it where lies the silence. And the rim is a mass of rocks that were never used by the gods when they made the worlds. And on it sat Trogul. Trogul is the thing that is neither god nor beast, who neither howls nor breathes. Only it turns over the leaves of a great book, black and white, black and white, forever, until the end. And all that is to be is written in the book, and also all that was. When it turneth a black page, it is night, and when it turneth a white page, it is day. Because it is written that there are gods, there are the gods. Also there is writing about thee and me, until the page where our names no more are written. Then, as the prophet watched it, Trogul turned a page, a black one, and night was over and day shone on the worlds. Trogul is the thing that men in many countries have called by many names. It is the thing that sits behind the gods, whose book is the scheme of things. But when Yardin saw that old remembered days were hidden away with the part that it had turned, and knew that upon one whose name is written no more, the last page had turned for ever a thousand pages back, then did he utter his prayer in the face of Trogul, who only turns the pages and never answers prayer. He prayed in the face of Trogul, Only turn back thy pages to the name of one which is writ no more, and far away, upon a place named Earth, shall rise the prayers of a little people that acclaim the name of Trogul. For there is indeed far off a place called Earth, where men shall pray to Trogul. Then spake Trogul, who turns the pages and never answers prayer and his voice was like the murmurs of the waste at night, when echoes have been lost. Though the whirlwind of the south should tug with his claws at a page that hath been turned, yet shall he not be able to ever turn it back. Then, because of words in the book that said that it should be so, Yardin found himself lying in the desert, where one gave him water, and afterwards carried him on a camel into Bodrahan. There some said that he had but dreamed, when thirst seized him while he wandered among the rocks in the desert. But certain aged men of Bodrahan said that indeed there sitteth somewhere a thing that is called Trogul, that is neither god nor beast, that turneth the leaves of a book, black and white, black and white, until he come to the words, Ma Dun Izan, which means the end for ever, and book and gods and worlds shall be no more. That was part one of the gods of... That was part one. Join us next time for part two. And, uh, yeah, next book I'll probably be able to pronounce the name better. Thank you. This has been People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, brought to you by BunnySlippers.com, FoundAdamClothing.com. We're part of Dark Myths Collective. Check us out at DarkMyths.org, PGTTCM, PGTTCM.Podbean.com, and PGTTCM.Threadless.com is where you can find a t-shirt or so. We're on all the social medias worth being on, and uh, thank you for listening, and we'll, we'll, we'll see you next time, or we'll, you'll hear us next time, whatever. Okay, bye.